The next step in the drawing program would be the plaster rounds. Here we see a man and a woman evaluating a drawing of a statue of Venus observed by lamp light. This lesson would be the achievement of an advanced drawing student, concentrating on the perspective of light direction from a single candle and the particulars of cast shadows and reflections. Gorey would write, Plaster is an introduction to learn how to draw after the life. Drawing after plaster is harder than drawing after pictures, because in plaster, the certainty of the circumference stroke is not so apparent, neither the shadows nor lights in such a manner apparent as they are in pictures, drafts, or prints. Gorey would emphasize, first you shall choose a good place and principally a good light, for in the manner of the light is a great matter, in regard that here you must seek to obtain the most pleasant shades. In this workshop scene, we see the foreground student properly viewing and drawing a plaster round of a flayed figure in action. There is another student in the middle background. Note that both students are sitting to draw. 17th century picture drawers did not stand in front of an easel as many do today. Notice that the foreground student is drawing on paper and also that he is not drawing in the shadow of his own hand. In Chenini's art making manual, he advised, arrange to have the light diffused when you are drawing and have the light fall over your left side. Of course, if one drew with their left hand like Leonardo da Vinci, one would want the light to fall from the right. On the floor is a pile of ancient plaster rounds. In the 17th century, the financial success of a master artist was usually distinguished by the number of bronze and cast sculptures in his private collection. This would be another perk to learn under a guild-approved master. Such a variety of statues would benefit the student with many drawing challenges. Notice that cast sculptures were not always pure white. From the previous painting, the central subject of the flayed figure is of a flesh color, while some gray tone sculptures can be seen on the floor. Two details from other 17th century paintings also confirm the evidence. Mid-tone plaster rounds were helpful for the young learner to better observe lights and shades, especially when using toned paper that matched the same general tone of the sculpture. However, another reason is given by Marshall Smith in his 1692 publication. Light falling on white plastiques, though round like flesh, make a certain unpleasant and too apparent reflections. Several painters have run into errors by painting after antique statues and plastiques, observing the light as it falls upon whence their flesh appeareth unnatural. Thus, drawing from pure white plaster rounds could mar a student's good judgment, causing him in future paintings to unconsciously produce human flesh tones with a cold stone appearance. This boy is drawing with chalk on what appears to be a slightly bowed wooden board. A sheet of paper is underneath it. He may be learning how to do a counterproof drawing in that, once he achieved a good basic image on the panel, he would then dampen the expensive paper and lay the sheet on top. He would proceed to rub over the image, allowing the chalk to adhere onto the moist paper to make an imprint of the drawing in the reverse. This rubbed drawing would then be redrawn in chalk or with pen and ink. Note again that the plaster round is not white. What appears as a fine laced piece of cloth rests on its head, perhaps for the student to learn about visual perceptibilities. A drawing folio or a copy book is employed as support on his lap. His chalks and sharpening knife are on the floor, and there is a partial wing, likely from a dove. The wing feather or feathers 
were used both as an eraser and as a blender for dry media like chalk or charcoal, and its use is mentioned in many instructional manuals. In this painting, note the wing feathers on the table. In a 1652 drawing book by Thomas Jenner, he writes, The feather is to wipe out the charcoal where it is drawn incorrectly, and this you must be sure to do, or else you will be confounded with a variety of strokes so that you shall not know which is the right stroke. From my experience, sweeping a feather over a chalk or willow charcoal drawing produces wonderful effects. Not only does it remove excess dust, but adds a nice softening quality. Also, more importantly, the fine barbs on the feather help to maintain the gripping surface or tooth of the paper, enabling added layers of chalk to be applied. The rubber eraser that we know today was invented in the late 1700s and, as with most modern erasers, the constant use of them has a tendency to flatten the tooth of the paper, producing a slick surface. This encourages the application of subsequent layers with a heavy hand. In the 17th century, copying prints and plaster rounds was not to be an apish imitation or a superficial rendering of exactness. This is importantly explained in a 1641 Dutch publication. As many then as desire to express the principal virtues of the best and most approved artificers, they must not contend themselves with a slender and superficial viewing of the works they mean to imitate, but they are to take them in their hands again and again, never leaving till they have perfectly apprehended the force of art that is in them, and also to thoroughly acquaint themselves with that spirit. Rash and inconsiderate beginners work upon the first sight before they have the deep and hidden mysteries of art, pleasing themselves wonderfully with a good success of their imitation, seeking only the outward lines and colors, and therefore do they never attain to that force of art. The true following of a rarer master's art does not consist in an apish imitation of the outward ornaments, but rather in the expressing of the inward force. In the 17th century, monkeys were portrayed as artists, the joke being that the monkey does not understand the complexity of the action it performs, and by merely copying, it does not need to think about visual painterly skills, knowledge of anatomy, perspective or proportions, narrative inventions or original ideas, or the force of art. To better understand this 17th century copying concept and capturing that spirit or force of art, I shall explain with two of my own examples. In the middle is my drawing, based on observing and combining two different sources that inspired me to reinvent a visual idea. To the left is a detail from a Sebastian Ricci painting. Note how this figure is standing stationary, with a bent leg resting on a rock ledge. The baby looks over her shoulder with shyness. Whereas, in my figure, there is a forward-stepping motion with a twisting body, the baby's gaze is squarely upon the viewer. I wanted to capture this sense of action as observed from the Rembrandt ink drawing on the right. The force of art concept is firstly expressed through effective lights and shadows with set-off backgrounds to create an illusion of depth. The purpose of the force of art is directing and arresting the viewer's eye accomplished through the sweeping upward flow of the garment and the twist into the baby's direct gaze. The woman's headdress in my drawing and the baby's blanket hanging straight stabilizes the action. Details concentrate upon the point of interest, the baby and the woman's face. Here I combine two images from Blomert's copybook, 
with the intent to arrest the viewer with an emotional response. This would be accomplished through the visual force of the two figures. Notice that I did not meticulously copy all the folds in the sleeve of the woman. I made her shorter and gave more emphasis on her facial expression and hand through, again, the original 17th century understanding of backgrounds. In the Blomert print, she is gazing downward, but I made her look directly at the viewer with ghostly eyes. She is spatially set off from the beggar, who, being in the background, is shaded lighter in accordance to the 17th century concept of distant grounds. I also moved his arm, holding the plate, so that the narrative becomes complete. Therefore, in copying, students were encouraged to excel in their own powers of originality and creative abilities. They were to avoid confining themselves by imitating only for preciseness, which would foster a certain stagnation in their art, or by adhering only to copy and images, an artist would deter themselves from innovations. Here we see numerous head studies of the Venus Medici by a 17th century leisure artist. His drawing suggests that he was not aiming for exactness or the perfect head. Rather, applying the egg lesson as discussed in the previous chapter, his head studies appear more to reflect his own concern for the personal understanding of lights and shades, proportion, and facial perspectives. He sought for a solid learning experience to become a proficient artist, rather than focusing on the goal to wonderfully please himself with a good success of imitation. So what were considered such drawings in the 17th century? Drawings such as these from the 19th century art academies, almost 200 years later. Compare these cast drawings with quotes from various 17th century manuscripts regarding this manner of drawing. A superficial viewing of the works. He who seeks to slavishly imitate antiquity is deceiving himself. Such drawings have turned to stone, lacking in charming vitality, and originate with painstaking labor. Pretend not to be among the quality of painters who only copy and therein employ their whole industry to that only talent, and then think to be an able painter. Then there is the famous quote by Apelles, Nothing is more prejudicial to painters than too much exactness, and that the greatest part of them know not when they had done enough. Another way to avoid apish imitation was to turn the cold stone sculpture to life by adding lifelike glistenings. By animating plaster rounds with the passions or the drama of human emotions, a student would avoid exact imitation while also learning a wide range of important facial expressions. Remember from the previous lecture chapter that the first drawing lessons in the copy books were the movable facial features of eyes and mouths. Now, through plaster rounds, this knowledge was to be applied. And finally, from a well-known master, Peter Paul Rubens would write in his essay titled On the Imitation of Statues, I am convinced that in order to achieve the highest perfection, one needs a full understanding of ancient statues, even a complete absorption in them but one must take judicious use of them and, above all, avoid the effect of stone. A 17th century student was also encouraged to rearrange the compositions of great masterpieces, a practice that every experienced master would continue, as in this example by Rembrandt. Rembrandt never traveled to Italy, so he never saw da Vinci's Last Supper in person. Still, he did a sketch from an etching of the famous masterpiece. Rembrandt's interest here was to play around with the composition, like changing the background and adding a dog in the corner. But what apparently captured his eye were the zigzag patterns 
and triangular shapes within da Vinci's design of the group. This is evident by the darker lines Rembrandt employs for clearer emphasis. Rembrandt apparently repeats the triangle motif and zigzag movement within the curtain drapery. This is having fun with invention. This is not being a mimicking parrot or an ape. One of Rembrandt's students, Samuel van Hoogstraten, would later write in his 1678 art manuscript, The Enlading, Copying all manner of paintings is a common and very useful exercise, especially if the example is a fine work of art. If you find a good print, it will not always be necessary to copy every part of it, but learn early on to differentiate and select the various virtues of art. One should follow the works of other masters in order to learn how to make masterpieces. Rubens copied da Vinci's famous The Battle of Anghiari, however, not from the original fresco by the Italian master, but rather from an etching of it. The fresco, executed in 1505 by da Vinci for the Palazzo della Signoria in Florence, was destroyed in 1560, long before Rubens was even born. In the development of one's unique style, Poussin summarized the 17th century mindset about this topic. Style is a particular manner and skill in painting and drawing which comes from the particular genius of each individual in his way of applying and using ideas. This style, manner, or taste comes from nature and intelligence. Most art historians have over-exaggerated the polarity between the art of Poussin and Rubens. This is based from the quarreling conferences and intellectual arguments held at the French Academy in the late 1600s into the 1700s. The contention was between classical art academics over a centralized art doctrine, an event which happened only after the death of the two great painters. Pompously, the classical art academics would authorize their critical opinions over the two deceased masters, as if speaking on their behalf. Aside from all their foolishness, let's consider Poussin's statement again. The key words are manner, skill, the particular genius of each individual, the applying and using ideas, nature and intelligence. These were familiar phrases to a 16th and 17th century artist, of which Rubens would have also understood and thus would have likely agreed with Poussin wholeheartedly. Here we see a painter leaning over to correct a student's drawing with a reed pen. It is not a portrait of the artist himself training his children, as be the first impression. Rather, interior Dutch scenes like this were popular to a buying public who would enjoy all the details and recognize the meanings of all the symbols. Note the plaster rounds, including the ox representing the Guild of St. Luke. The cast sculpture of the male figure has been identified as St. Sebastian by the 16th century Italian artist Alessandro Vittoria. A folio of original drawings available to be copied rests on top of a storage trunk on the floor. Note the direction of light from the window. The girl is in the process of sharpening her chalk stick while remaining attuned to the master's corrections upon her drawing. Zooming in on the items on the table, we can see the art materials employed when a student has reached the advanced drawing lessons of plaster rounds. There is a red-brown ink pot with a partial quill pen, a white container of water, a seashell which was used as a mini palette to dilute the ink with water for tonal washes, as noted by the presence of small brushes. And there are some white and black chalk sticks. Notice the toned papers being used by the student. A print, ready to be copied, 
hangs on the edge of the table. Art historians have identified it as a colored woodcut by the Dutch painter Jan Levines. The instructor corrects the drawing in ink. This is evident by the reed pen he is holding and the darker tick marks on the student's drawing. Remember Van de Passy's extensive drawing book in uh, Chapter 2? Well, this chalk sketch is by him, likely as a student, under his father's training. Note the darker ink lines in the eyes, nose, and mouth. These are tick mark corrections, possibly made by his father, to give more expression to the face. Note also that the overall drawing by the young Van de Passy lacks assertive confidence and a full knowledge in the art of drawing. This is evident by the indecisive, breezy line work of the unfinished garment that appears more like flying wings rather than a fine fabric laying squarely upon the shoulders. Note as well the overall sameness of line width, which appears contrived, perhaps from uncertain observation. Note also the unsure shadings with the haphazard smudging in of red chalk for flesh coloring. The drawing may also appear extensively softened by an overuse of a feather eraser. Gorey would eloquently write encouragement for the young picture drawer. Strive to get the best manner of drawing, and although the beginnings do not please us, it matters little, for none is born a master, and one can never be expected to do well that never did do ill. We learn from day to day, we amend from day to day, and all is for to become a complete and well-experienced picture drawer.